Welcome to this biomechanics video about the basic mechanical properties of bone. In this, uh, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge Daryl Thalen at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who put together the first draft of these slides that I've adapted. So thank you, Daryl. Bone is everywhere in the human body, the knee, the spine, the hip, the feet, shoulders, everywhere. The skeleton uh, is incredibly important because it functions as an augmentation for movement. Without the skeleton, we couldn't move and it protects us. So the basic functions of bone are to provide structural support, provide attachment sites for muscles, to protect our internal organs, and to act as a repository of calcium, which our muscles need uh, for contraction, er, contracting. The bones also house the bone marrow, which produces our blood and our stem cells. So bones are super important to the human body. This is a micrograph of a cross-section of the femur, and it really nicely illustrates the two different kinds of bone in the human body that we're going to be focusing on in this, comparing in this video. Down here in the shaft of the long bone, we have cortical or compact bone. Um, this is sometimes called hard bone. It, as we'll see, carries load really, really well. And then up here at the top end, at the proximal end of the bone, we have the cancellus or trabecular or sometimes called spongy bone um, that has a very different structure. It's much more of a mesh looking structure than the compact bone. So um, those are the two kinds of bone and they have really different mechanical properties. Even though they're both bone and they're both chemically very similar, um, they, have, they behave very differently with response to load. So the cortical bone is very stiff and it carries um, load very well, especially in compression. You can see that there. It has a ultimate strength of around 165 megapascals based on this graph. Um, whereas it, but it doesn't compress very much at all, maybe 2% strain. Trabecular bone, on the other hand, you can see um, still hasn't failed there at 30% strain. So it can, it can crush quite a bit. Uh, this is a compression graph, so it can crush quite a bit. But it doesn't carry load at all. It's not even above 10 megapascals there. For reference, um, so that tells you that the um, behavior of the different types of bone um, under loading is very, very different, and that plays a role in where you find the bone in the human body um, and how it helps us. For reference, here are the mechanical properties of tendon, ligament, and cartilage, the other primary musculoskeletal tissues. And you can see that tendon is kind of in between cortical bone and trabecular bone, um, though those are tension data, not compression data. And cartilage, which is also compression data, uh, you can see is similar to trabecular bone, but it has a very different structure and purpose and role in the body. For comparison, in a material science class, you may have seen uh, steel and aluminum, stress strain curves for those. So here's the stress strain curve for steel overlaid on top of the cortical bone. You can see that the shape is a little bit similar, but there's a much larger plastic deformation region for the steel and a much higher ultimate stress compared to the bone. And here's aluminum. So it has a similar st ultimate stress to the uh, cortical bone, but it has a lower yield stress. And again, it has a greater uh, plastic deformation region, region to where it can, can crush and store energy. So we're going to be focusing on cortical and trabecular bone in this presentation. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the different things that make up bone. So to start with, there are bone cells. There are three types of cells in the bone. There are osteoblasts which form, recruit, and synthesize um, cells to create bone. There are osteocytes and lining cells which maintain the bone. Uh, and they reside permanently in the bone. And then there are osteoclasts, which are large cells with multiple nuclei um, that are dedicated to reabsorbing the bone. Uh, because bone is a constantly remodeling tissue. That's one of the reasons it heals so well when it breaks is because it's naturally constantly remodeling throughout our lives. So bone is made up of a couple of different groups of things. One, the cells that we just talked about, osteoclasts, osteoblasts, and osteocytes. Let's see if you can remember which one it is that builds bone. It's also made up of organic matrix, which is 50% by its volume and 20% by its weight of the bone as a whole. Um, the organic matrix is 90% collagen type 1 and 10% non-collagenous proteins and proteoglycans. The inorganic or mineral phase of the bone uh, is 50% by volume and 70% by weight. 
It's mostly made of calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate with a little magnesium, sodium, and fluoride, um, which are trace elements that can be used actually to tell you quite a bit about where somebody has lived and what they've eaten and um, kind of what their environment is. Uh, it's used in archaeological um, environments as a tracer. And then also um, hydroxyapatite crystals uh, and amorphous calcium phosphate um, form the inorganic or mineral phase of the bone, which is the part that we usually think about when we think about bone, because we think about um, kind of the dead, hard, mineral part of the bone. The molecular structure of the mineral phase of the bone uh, consists of hydroxyapatite crystals, which are about 225 nanometers long and 10 nanometers thick and have this kind of diamond shape or truncated diamond shape shown on the right there. These hydroxyapatite crystals have a regular arrangement on the collagen fibrils that are, perform or that are the uh, organic matrix. Uh, so you can see the collagen fibril there, which is made up of bundles of collagen molecules, which we'll talk about in the tendon video. And then the apatite crystals, the HA crystals, are, are aligned um, in pattern, a pattern on them. So that's the molecular structure of the bone. At the microscopic level, so coming up a level from the molecular level, um, this is what a micrograph of cortical bone looks like. Okay, so cortical bone was the hard bone. And you can see these round shapes that are called osteons. And they form the basis of the structure of the bone. And you can see the one that the scale bar down in the lower left that's 500 microns. And you can see the osteon that's labeled as 200 microns there with the red scale bars. So osteons range from about 200, maybe 150 microns to about 400 microns in diameter. And they're made up of several things. At the center of an osteon is the Haversian canal. The Haversian canal uh, is where the blood vessel is. And the blood vessels are connected to the intermedullary cavity. Okay, so there's a constant blood supply to bone. You need a blood supply if something's going to remodel and fix. And then around uh, the Haversian canals are the lacunae, which contain the osteocytes. It's where the osteocytes live. Uh, and then between the osteons, are cement lines. You can see some of those in the micrograph on the right where the osteons bump up against each other and they don't fuse into one thing. You can still see a boundary in between them. Interestingly, this is one of the things that people use in arguments about whether or not dinosaurs were warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Uh, you see very different microstructure um, in warm-blooded animals. There's lots more Haversian canals and lots more blood supply to the bone. And you can see that in the archaeological record and fossils. So um, dinosaurs don't have a strictly speaking, or most dinosaurs don't have a strictly speaking warm-blooded um, kind of bone structure, but they also don't have a bone structure that matches current cold or modern cold-blooded reptiles either. So it's an interesting piece of evidence in that were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded argument. Osteons themselves are composed of alternating collagen fiber orientations on concentric lamellae. Lamellae are these layers of bone that you can see kind of cut away in the figure there. And you can see the orientation of the collagen fibrils uh, kind of alternating as you go there around the Haversian canal. And that actually gives quite a bit of strength um, and creates a fiber reinforced composite kind of effect around for a single lamellae. Um, and then here in this micrograph, you can see that three micron thickness of the individual lamellae and what those look like. So that 20 micron line in the center there is the Haversian canal. And then the, you can see the layers, the rings of the lamellae uh, there. This is perpendicular to the Haversian canal. So trabecular bone, um, this is a 3D image of, uh, of trabecular bone on the right. It's a 3D porous network of interconnected struts that are called trabeculi. And in a healthy individual, they're about, or a healthy bone, they're about 200 microns thick. Each trabecula has a lamellar structure. So those lamellae that we were looking at just a minute ago, um, each of those is kind of one lamellae. And the orientation of the trabeculi and the porosity varies based on the anatomic location, the biomechanical function that the bone experiences, and the age of the subject. It also depends on the loading history. 
um, which is one of the really interesting things about bone that we'll talk about in the next video. At a macroscopic level, so levels or sizes greater than one millimeter, the properties of trabecular to bone are strongly dependent on the relative density, architecture, and location of the bone. So here's a table from the biomechanics handbook showing uh, samples from the proximal tibia, the femur, and the lumbar spine. And you can see that the relative density varies by site. You can see that the modulus of elasticity varies pretty widely by site. The ultimate stress, similarly, and the ultimate strain also varies widely by site. So um, the Properties very much depend on density, architecture, and location. And we'll talk more about how you uh, change those. But first, I want to point out something about the stress-strain graphs here. So these are the three samples that were sites we were just looking at. Stress on the vertical axis, strain on the horizontal axis uh, for trabecular bone in compression. And you'll note that all of the graphs have a linearly elastic region, though it's very different, as you would expect for different moduli. The graphs then have this region of plastic collapse, which is where um, the struts start to fail before they finally become packed and start to carry load as, in a crushed fashion um, in a phase called densification. So trabecular bone um, has this very long region of plastic collapse from about 20% strain to 60% strain, depending on um, where you're talking about in the body before uh, you start to just kind of have this crushing effect with densification. For cortical bone, so the long hard bone, the modulus of elasticity and ultimate strength depend on the direction of loading, which means that this is an anisotropic material and you can see in the bottom there um, samples taken in different orientations, longitudinal 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and then transverse. And you can see that the stress strain curve changes substantially with that. And cortical bone also depends on uh, the loading rate. It's a viscoelastic material, so the faster you load it, um, the stiffer it gets. Here are some mechanical properties for uh, bone that you can, can see the modulus in the different orientations. And again, you can see that it varies widely. Uh, Poisson's ratio also varies widely. And then the ultimate strength in the longitudinal direction, tension, compression, and shear. Bone does better in compression than tension, um, and better in both tension and compression than in shear, the cortical bone. So at a microscopic level, bone is like a fiber-reinforced composite. The hydroxyapatite mineral provides stiffness for the bone, and the collagen fibers provide tensile strength and ductility for the bone, the ability for it to store energy uh, and tension. And then the trabecular struts are just slightly less stiff than cortical bone at this scale. So at the micron level, there is a little bit of a difference between the trabeculi or the trabecular bone and the cortical bone. But at a macro level, there are significant differences in cortical and trabecular bone mechanics. In the next video, we'll talk about the response to loading and how bone remodels in response to loading. Um, but this is an overview of the mechanical properties of bone and how they vary by bone type. See you in the next video.